Good morning, Eduardo. You are co-chairperson of the Global Assessment on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, and also distinguished professor in anthropology at Indiana University. I want to ask you about the science behind biodiversity and species loss and, and the assessment. Is this the second existential crisis other than climate change facing, facing humanity? Well, thank you for this question. I mean, I think biodiversity is now entering into the conversation, the larger conversation about global change, climate change, and development. What I would say is that climate change and biodiversity are indivisible. And I think that's one of the contributions that we have from the perspective of the global assessment. And that's because they have mutual impacts. So the kinds of, of impacts that we've been accumulating on the global environment, which is, you know, sort of, we need to think about biodiversity and ecosystems more broadly, have a direct impact on climate change. And vice versa, you know, the climate change that we're observing now is having already a direct impact on biodiversity. So you have a process that exacerbates each other and that is interdependent. Because if you think about adaptation and mitigation measures, they have to come together in terms of addressing both biodiversity issues and climate change issues. You know, for instance, think about uh, climate change as a driver of biodiversity. Today is already the third driver of biodiversity. It's projected in the coming decade or two to become the first driver of biodiversity loss, right? So very interdependent. At the same time, Ecosystems today absorb, I would say, close to a third of our emissions. So they play a very fundamental role in, uh, in addressing climate change and can play an even bigger role going forward. But there's another, I think, interface that you know, is very important here between climate change, ecosystems, and biodiversity. Ecosystems, health ecosystems, and healthy biodiversity mediate the impact of climate change on people and on nature, right? So what I'm pointing here is that we need to look up those issues as part of the same problem. And therefore, think about addressing them synergistically. How serious is the challenges around biodiversity and species loss? Uh, is it accelerating? What's the, what's, the, what's the scale of the challenge? Well, what we have shown in the global assessment, which is the most comprehensive of its kind, right? And we paid attention to in particular the last 50 years, but as much as possible, a longer time frame. So what we show is that the impacts that we have on the planet, particularly during the, since the Second World War, you know, exacerbated and escalated exponentially. So we show that on the aggregate, we have about, so transform 75% of the land surface, you know, about 65% of the oceans, and wiped out basically 85% of wetlands, right? So at, that's the aggregate level. But what does it mean? You know, it means that what we saw is that every single indicator of ecosystem health and biodiversity health are declining, right? So of course, this is an even globally, but when we look at the aggregate, it's declining. So that includes ecosystem extent and integrity, right? Uh, the size of populations of animals and plants are becoming very confined. The distinctiveness of local ecological community, right? More homogenized communities than, than uh, the original diversity. Incredible amount of biodiversity or species threatened to extinction under the current, you know, pressures and projected pressures that led us you know, to estimate a 1 million species threatened with extinctions as we go in the coming uh, several decades. But also there are other elements that are important. For instance, local varieties of crops, what we call the agrobiodiversity, is also, you know, decre decreasing in most parts of the world. And that provides the basis of a lot of our, our agriculture today. So those are indicators, you know, that uh, we have uh, evaluated globally that are currently in decline. Of course, this area is regional. So tourism is a major source of revenue for conservation and for protection of species in many parts of the world, but it also depends for its very survival 
on wildlife, on biodiversity? How serious is a threat to the tourism economy? That's a really good question because what I haven't mentioned yet is the evaluation that we did on the decline in what we call nature's contributions to people, right? Or also called ecosystem services. And here's a really interesting connection, I think, to tourism. We evaluated 18 of such dimensions of how we depend on nature. What we found is that of those 18 dimensions, 14 are declining. Right? And four are sort of stable or growing. The four that are stable and growing are basically our extraction and what we, you know, nature provide us in terms of material goods. You know, how you open land, use land, use resources. This, that's growing. We continue to, to expand frontiers. The 14 that are declining are in the areas of what we call regulating services, like the functions of ecosystems that allow us to have clean water, clean air, good soils, mm -hmm. you know, diverse species, and the non-material uh, contributions or more cultural contributions. And here's what I think is interesting for the tourist uh, industry. Those are the fundamental pillars of, you know, what provides a good environment for tourism. Right? People go to appreciate the non-material benefits, the beauty, right? the sense of place, and the spiritual value of nature among others, right? and depend on a healthy and clean ecosystem. So when we look at the most declining contributions of nature are the ones that are most important to a sector and to many other sectors, but to a sector like tourism. So as a, as a scientist, uh, what is your your elevated pitch message to governments about taking this seriously and adopting science-based targets and, and policies and measures? Well, I mean, first is, is seeing all those issues as interconnected and therefore think about policies that address them together, right? And we see very divergent views about that around the planet today. You know, we see sectors of governments that are bringing the economy or the, the environment to the core of the economy and not separating anymore economic development you know, from environmental conservation, from addressing climate change. But you have also governments you know, that perpetuate an idea and opposition between economic growth and environmental conservation. So I think we are at a very you know, particular moment of really coming together and think about those issues as interdependent. Right, and therefore promote policy that look at their interactions. So that's the first thing because it's an issue of vision. It's an issue of um, uh, you know leadership and vision about it that frames the issue in a different way and overcomes the polarization that we have today. Second point, we have a, a plenty of instruments that are out there that could be deployed, that could put in place or enhanced to address our current problems. Because one important message I think that we need to have is that we've been trying to react to those problems for a long time. And there are many advances and many improvements that we have made, right? We tend to focus on you know, our inability to really confront the problem seriously, but there's a lot of initiatives in place and we need to build upon those initiatives. We need to value those initiatives that are trying to overcome these problems, particularly at the local level or regional level. Right, and leverage on that. So that's another point, recognizing that people are working, people are concerned about that, there are things going on, and that's what we need to leverage on, you know, to, uh, to advance. I think we need cross-sectoral policies. I think we're, we're past the time, you know, when we have sectors dealing independently with resources and issues that are otherwise connected. And I mean, that's a really important step, you know, to develop cross-sectoral you know, framings and plannings in which we look at, you know, the impact of different sectors and how different sectors can find synergies with other sectors to, you know, improve management as a whole, right? So the, the, the typical combination would be, you know, the water management sector, right? land use planning, energy planning, conservation. Those are all interdependent. And one of the features of the, what we the world that we live today is connectivity. We're all interconnected and we have, you know, well, what I would call a functional dependency or interdependence on each other. 
So if someone is managing, you know, the, the headwaters of a watershed, right, in a way that impacts downstreams, and downstreams, for instance, is an important place of community-based tourism, you have an independence that is very distant, but nonetheless affect each other. So we need to start, I think, saying cross-sectorally, um, relate what we do locally with the larger environment and the larger uh, issues that we deal with, uh, and implement um, the kinds of uh, approaches that we know could help us to overcome those issues. So in response to the COVID-19 crisis and the economic crisis, this, this unprecedented flows of, of financing in the system, is the opportunity here to, to, to direct that funding to also help with this great rebalancing between people and nature and nature and business? Completely. I mean, if we think the current, you know, the, some of the, the underlying, the root cause of some of the problems that we have today is that the types of subsidies that we provide to business uh, or to policies, they tend to encourage either sectoral, right, or destructive management practices. So just reorientation of subsidies and new subsidies as incentive you know, for business and, and, uh, and policies to move towards more integrated management to internalize environmental and social costs, you know, in their accounting would go a long way. So we are at a period of making decisions about economic stimulus. I think there's already a voice for a green recovery or, you know, many other ways that you can think about it, including a recovery of social inequality. So we have a very critical moment where you know, changes in the way we distribute subsidies and the accountability for subsidies can help many sectors, you know, towards a more sustainable economy and a recovery that will be more sustainable and resilient, uh, resilient over time. Eduardo, thank you very much for spending time with us this morning and for offering your insights. Much appreciated.